In case you missed the announcement last week, I have a, uh, a merch store now. It's a it's spread shop store. There's a few shirts up and a few designs up. Hopefully you guys enjoy the stuff that I put up there. And if it gets a good response, I'll, I'll be doing more of that. So uh, check that out. Link in the pinned comment and in the description. All right. Today I'm doing another member's request. This is from Commander Nathaniel Mead. And today we will be looking at the Yorktown class. There's been a bit of controversy on the members' discord. We've been discussing the Yorktown class and there's a great deal of debate over whether or not the Yorktown is the NX's true successor. You see, the Yorktown is a very interesting ship. It's a fan cannon ship. It's a fanon ship in as much as it's a ship that basically the entire fandom agrees should exist. And that's literally the only thing keeping it back from being canon. That being said, not a lot is known about it. Um, it's going to be featured in the second part of the Romulan War fan film. Though interestingly, if you look at it, they've actually modelled it largely off the Antares class. Not that Antares class, this Antares class. There's a lot of Antares classes. And yeah, there's a lot of disagreement about the Yorktown and what exactly it is. Is the Yorktown the replacement for the NX class? Okay, the first thing to do with the Yorktown is let's take a look at the design. I'm using this design from Ages of the Federation. Now, first thing to mark is that it's claimed to have a 400 meter length. That is absurd. That is silly. A more appropriate length is around about 240, 250 meters bigger than the NX, but not by much. It's more just that it's got more heft and mass than anything else, rather than being uh, particularly longer. It has a very different warp geometry as well. The engines are oriented very differently to the NX, and we'll come back to that because that is a very critical point when answering this question. The most notable thing is, of course, it comes with a engineering hull, which is quite rare in the 22nd century. We can say also that this was built from the ground up to incorporate an engineering hull. It was always going to have an engineering hull. It's not like the NX where it had the engineering hull refitted onto it later, and that was to basically improve its combat performance. This was always intended to have an engineering hull and for it to be mounted underneath the saucer like that. You also notice with that warp geometry that it's much more conservative, much more protected. It seems far more concerned with achieving a relatively low profile than it is with high performance. The other main features is of course because it has that secondary hull and that big navigational deflector, this ship now has the capability of mounting a deflector shield, which is a pretty important development. Most human ships of the period do not have deflector shields. They are reliant on hull plating and other active defences. Now, a little caveat here, this shield is not that powerful. It will go down pretty quickly under fire, but it's something. It just gives you that little bit of protection before you have to rely on your hull plating. And it's upgunned. It's got 14 phase cannons and 8 torpedo tubes. In fact, it matches the Romulan Cabbage class cruiser which is quite impressive. So, well, this looks like a straightforward evolution, right? Wrong. Now, if we are talking about the NX refit that appeared during the Romulan War, that wartime refit, yes, very yes. There's a lot in common between this and the NX refit. But the key word is wartime refit. The NX was never meant to have that refit or never intended to. The NX was always intended to be what we saw in, in, in the run of Enterprise. There was no real need for that refit until it found itself in a war. And the addition of the secondary hull, while that is something that of course would st stick around, it didn't necessarily follow. There's all sorts of issues that are attached to, um, it's, it's, you know, it's not something that Starfleet was going in for at the time, and they were only really adding these secondary hulls really out of necessity, because as I say, it gave them better range, better sustainability, more reliable Warp 5 engines, more comfortable Warp 5 engines, 
And it also gave them deflector shields, which when you're taking long range volleys of fusion torpedoes, they're quite nice to have. The key thing to mention about that NX refit is that it's not a whole system upgrade. This is not the constitution refit where, you know, they, they strip out whole elements of the ship and put in pretty much completely new and original parts. This is an add-on, and I'm not even sure that all the NX-class ships of the war would have actually had the additional secondary hull, because that would have probably been further cost and expense on what was already quite an expensive ship of the time. Although, as I say, as the war goes on and human infrastructure develops, of course, the cost of building those kind of things goes down and down and down, and that's why by the end of the war you can have things like the Yorktown getting launched. Fundamentally, it was not an evolutionary upgrade, it was a wartime upgrade. In much the same way, for example, that the, the Venture-type refit of the Galaxy class is not a sort of a linear refit of the Galaxy, it's a wartime refit to basically up-gun and up the protection. But it's not intended to, you know, serve as the next generation of that vessel. This is then further complicated that post-war and post the formation of the Federation in about 2280 we'll see the launch of the Rockwell class. Now it's interesting actually comparing the Rockwell and the Yorktown there are some similarities definitely certainly in terms of the shapes that are being used but there's also dramatic differences in the geometry and angles at play in the design. The Rockwell is more intended to be a direct successor to the NX, the original NX, and you can see that very visibly. It's still incorporated some of the lessons of the Romulan War. You do have a more distinctive engineering section. They realize having a distinctive engineering section is quite useful and quite nice and handy. There's a whole discussion there about um, why ships should or shouldn't have separate engineering sections. Certainly the Rockwell leans more to having a distinct one than a put everything into the saucer, which is what the original NX was doing, and most of the ships predating NX as well. So, we have Yorktown, and we have Rockwell. Both of them claim that the NX is their mother, and both of them claim I'm the only child. I'll come back to that weird metaphor, trust me. As I say, Rockwell more closely follows the NX geometry, and the critical thing about the Rockwell compared to the Yorktown is that it, the Rockwell contains completely new technology rather than the Yorktown, which is using existing technology at the time and really just upscaling things. The Rockwell is not only upscaling things, but it's evolving and developing systems. The Rockwell is intended for a mission of exploration. The Yorktown is not. The Yorktown was taking the current generation of technology of the NX class and using that to build a battleship. It is a ship of war developed from a ship of exploration. It's got 14 phase cannons, 8 torpedo tubes. When we get to the Rockwell, we'll see, yes, yeah, 16 phase cannons, but we also only see 4 torpedo tubes. So... You can see there's a little bit of difference in the design and approach. And while the phase cannons are kind of increasing with the scale of the ship, which is kind of natural because you want to defend all arcs of fire, the emphasis of torpedoes, which were the primary offensive weapon of the period, is greatly diminished. That's also arguably because phase cannon technology had improved. So, in kind of summary, what I would say is that the Rockwell is... The legitimate child. It is the child of marriage. The Yorktown was conceived on the NX's hen night with some biker, probably. It's got a lot of NX DNA, but it's applying it in a very different way. As I say, the Rockwell is a very linear evolution of the NX into a next generation exploration vessel. The Yorktown is an evolution of the NX into a warship. Now, this is not to denigrate the importance of the Yorktown class. It was pretty critical, 
and did get into action for the final months of the Romulan War. And, you know, whether it was actually a tactical turning point is highly debatable, but in terms of morale, it was definitely a significant turning point in terms of morale, because it said to the people of United Earth that Starfleet was capable of building robust warships that could take on Romulan ships directly. It wasn't like the NX, which had to tiptoe around the biggest and heaviest Romulan ships. This is a ship that was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the heaviest Romulan ships, you know, the Sabinius and the Tyrannus, those big ships that were really the main fear of Earth during the war. This could take them on directly and win. Now, because the Yorktown took a long time to develop, Starfleet got very used to not having them. And so by the end of the war, there were already plenty of tactics in play that the rest of Starfleet was utilizing to defeat those larger Romulan ships. You know, was the Yorktown a little bit redundant in some respects? Yeah, yeah. But it certainly helped expedite the process of victory and made it very clear to the Romulans humans had evolved greatly since the start of the war and were no longer the pushovers they had first appeared. You know, and that if the Romulans were going to continue with the war, they could expect to see more and more ships like the Yorktown. It would likely last about as long as the NX in service, probably lasting into the early 23rd century. Wasn't the most mobile ship. Battleships in, in this sort of early period have a lot of limitations in terms of range and speed, but in a defensive role, they are very, very effective. In that respect, probably lasted quite a while, as defensive flagships, you know, the centre of a system group, if you like. It also then played a very critical part in shaping early Starfleet doctrine. Starfleet really did come to like having these heavier ships um, as part of their fleets. You have the NX, which was, you know, it was large, but it was always quite medium in its build. You know, they weren't following the suit of the Vulcans or Andorians, who were building quite big and heavy ships. The Yorktown is an attempt to kind of follow in that suit and build a large, powerful, heavier ship that is a little bit more specialised, isn't quite as universally applicable or as mobile as something like the NX. It's a little bit more tactically focused and it doesn't quite have the range and speed of the medium cruisers but it's got the heft to kind of serve as a center of gravity, if you like. And it would go on to not only shape Starfleet doctrine, but shape successive heavy cruisers. And when I say heavy cruisers, I mean very heavy cruisers slash battleships. This includes ships like the Challenger class, the Geronimo class, and the Proxima class. All very, very potent very impressive ships of their era. While they aren't as seen as often as the, the, the medium ships, the Constitution and the Asia class, which were much more mobile and built in far greater numbers, when you saw, you know, a Geronimo or a Proxima, much like a Yorktown, you stopped and took a moment because that's a very significant and very impressive vessel. Again, it's that whole sort of doctrine of a sort of a, a, a centre of gravity, which is what really was the key thing about the Yorktown. It brought a centre of gravity to the human fleets during the Romulan War, where they didn't really have one. They didn't really have anything strong enough that they could kind of coalesce around and, and use as a kind of as a, as a linchpin. And the Yorktown gave them that. So, in conclusion, I suppose all this video is to say is that technological development is very rarely a linear process. There are little bits of Yorktown in the Rockwell. They're not completely isolated, although in this chart they do appear that. Technological development is rarely linear. History has a knack of throwing spanners in the works and creates things that we would probably describe as aberrations. You look at, for example, uh, King Tiger, and then compare that to the uh, British and American uh, heavy tanks, the, the Conqueror and the M103 pattern. The, that one, the big one, the fat one. You look at those and you look at the Tiger and you think, oh, look, see, that, that, that was they were doing that. And it's like, kinda? 
kind of? You, you know, do you say that the German designers of King Tiger were ahead of the time, or do you, or, or do you just say that they were nuts? You know, how much foresight or wisdom do you want to attribute to people that are designing things during wartime? And the main thing is to just produce something that is useful and that you can get out into service quickly, even if it doesn't 100% work. Now, fortunately, the Yorktown pretty much did work, at least in, in the areas that it needed to. As on one level, wartime conditions can breed very innovative and creative solutions to difficult problems. On another level, it can also breed some very stupid and bad ideas. It largely depends on, on you know, the incentive structures around the military-industrial complex, what those structures actually reward. That's, again, a whole separate discussion around procurement, but an interesting one. So what do you guys think? Were Starfleet engineers reaching for the future with the Yorktown? Or were they just trying to make a big, dumb battleship? Let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you to my members. Thank you to my members. My Navarks, Jeffrey Ballard, Tully DT, and Rella. My Commanders, Miami Jules, Captain's Quarters, Chase Rector, PQSK, Philip Ty, Jeff Hallam, Bird Monster, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Guillermo Martinez, Das Blas, Adam Bowman, Nathaniel Mead, DM, Tribal Typhoon, Gabe Logan, Gabe Logan, Mr. Flegel, and Nicholas Walsh. And I salute my Centurions, Pendleberry, BOS Domestic Disputes, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Ockel Catum Quaesto, Squadra Course, Athies Collection, and Tobias Klein. And I thank all my loyal sub lieutenants. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.